Thank you so much, Jim, for having me and for everybody else who helped put this together. I'm really excited to get to talk to this crowd. We have to do a lot of talks, it seems, these days around this topic, and sometimes I find it challenging because it frequently takes away from the work, but I'm really excited to be here because I hope that I can recruit some of you into helping with this work because I think it's really important and um, really quite interesting as well. Um, just a little bit more on my background. I spent the last 10 years uh, at the PBS NewsHour covering science and technology. So I have a deep background in journalism, but prior to that, I was a web application developer during the first dot-com boom. So I've always maintained a set of programming skills, but I, um, I like to make the analogy to being an airplane mechanic. There's actual certified FAA airplane mechanics, and then there's uh, what they call shade tree mechanics, people who just know enough to be dangerous, and that's the category into which I fall. So it's a little odd giving a, a lecture to a group of computer scientists when I'm not one, but this is not a computer science lecture. This is a, lec this is a sort of talk about the work that we're doing and uh, my hope that you can help us figure out how to do it much more efficiently. Um, so the problem that we're trying to deal with is that disinformation continues to spread across social media. Um, we, it, it happened long before the 2016 election, but it's continued to grow ever since. It's evolving and changing, but it's, uh, it, it is a problem that, that persists to this day. Um, what, what does this problem look like? Uh, we have a, a number of definitions for what, what the problem can be, um, and I'm going to go through some uh, quick examples to start with. Um, this is an example of fabricated content. There's a uh, wide-held conspiracy theory that George Soros is involved in all manner of liberal and democratic things, which he is not, in fact, involved with. He is involved with some, but, but there's a much larger conspiracy theory around him. Uh, a couple of months ago, this meme and related news stories circulated tying him to Adam Schiff, a Democratic lawmaker, by suggesting that um, his son was married to his sister. Um, in fact, this is not true at all, but just to tease all of us, they put right into this meme, you can't make this up, just because they thought we'd appreciate that. Um, so sorry, so that, that, <laughs> that, so this is fabricated content, right? Something that was totally uh, false and imagined by someone, um, likely knowing that it was in fact false. Um, then there's another kind of misinformation that we refer to as false context. Um, so I'm going to read this out and then ask you guys about it. Um, this tweet says, illegal aliens are far more likely to commit federal crimes based on the statistics. They're 7% of the population, yet they commit 72% of drug possessions, 33% of money laundering, 29% of drug trafficking, 22% of murders, uh, and 18% of fraud. Bill that wall. Now these stats come actually from uh, a video piece that Tucker Carlson did on Fox News, but versions of these stats have circulated for a number of years now. Um, so I'd ask you all, what do you think of those stats? Do you think that these stats are true? They're unattributed, so, uh, so they're useless. That Based on that, I absolutely agree. In, in his story, he actually does attribute them, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you that one. Um, but is there, does anyone believe these stats? Does that seem to jive with your conception of, of the world that we actually live in? So the crazy thing about these stats is that they are true. The key is one term up at the very top of this tweet, federal crimes. Right? The majority of crimes are not prosecuted at the federal level. And so the, the people, I, I haven't done all of the background research to explain exactly why this is, but what we can tell is that um, undocumented um, and non-citizens are way overrepresented in the population of people that are uh, prosecuted for federal crimes. So the challenge in this piece of misinformation is that it's true, but the context is not there, and it becomes wildly misleading, especially when you add that slogan, build that wall, right? So here, just so you know, it's not all um, conservative misinformation. This one I dug up actually two days ago. It says, Trump says Declaration of Independence, quote, not true. Um, all men are not created equal. Now, it's actually, this quote, um, it's very confusing phrase to a lot of people, is true. Um, that he said not true is also uh, a part of the original quote, but it's taken completely out of context and unrelated to it, and he did not say that the Declaration of Independence is not true. Um, this was published on uh, a junk news website um, called Washington Daily Wire, which also coincidentally has another form of misinformation that we call imposter content, because it's actually impersonating a different website called Daily Wire, which is a conservative website. This one is a uh, liberal website called Washington Daily Wire. 
Here's another example of what I was just referring to, imposter content. This is a website that appeared about seven days ago. It's called New York Herald. I don't know if you can read it up there, but it says the nyherald.com. Now, the New York Herald, as a publication, hasn't been around, I think, since the 1930s. It evolved into the uh, New York Daily Herald and then the Herald Tribune. This is not that. <laughs> this website appeared just a couple of days ago. It's got a sort of random assortment of information. And actually, when you dig deeper, you find a lot of these stories don't actually have unique stories. In fact, like this story, this story, this story, and three of these, the text on all of them is as exactly the same. It's filler content. It might as well be Laura Mipsum for wh what value it has. But this site appeared and is sharing stories stories across social media now. Um, here's this one you might all recognize. Uh, this is a piece of manipulated content. This image was originally from a Teen Vogue cover spread um, in which Emma Gonzalez and other uh, anti-gun activists were originally shown tearing apart a uh, shooting target. So it was like the shape of a man with, a, with targets. And on 4chan, people said, let's turn that into something more exciting. And then they essentially photoshopped in uh, the Declaration of Independence. And they've got a video where she's tearing apart the Declaration of Independence. Um, so it was real content that was then manipulated in some way, colloquially say photoshopped, um, to change what it meant possibly dramatically. Um, and then sometimes it's satire. So this comes from a Facebook page we follow a lot called The Last Line of Defense. And what this says is, Congresswoman Atisha Nubbins, from Del Democrat from Delaware, just pushed in this bill. It will put an upper age limit on voting, eliminating all voters over the age of 60. It's kind of a crazy idea, first of all. When we investigated this, the first thing we investigated was uh, to learn more about Congresswoman Atisha Nubbins. It turns out there is no Congresswoman Atisha Nubbins. There certainly is no bill um, by this name or with this mission. We reverse image searched the face of this person and found out that she's actually an executive from a news organization. They just ripped her image. The site that creates this, it's, it's false, right? It's completely fabricated, but it's actually in its intention is satire. Uh, the person who runs the Facebook page believes that he's trying uh, conservatives by making fake memes that uh, make liberals look really bad and getting them to conserve uh, to uh, distribute them. What we find is that the people who subscribe to the page that publishes these don't always understand that. Some of the people do. Some people get that it's a joke. A lot of people don't, and they share it and they express outrage about what they're seeing. So even when its intention is satirical, the result can be misinforming. So. It's no surprise that that list of uh, types of misinformation I just described to you fit pretty neatly into this spectrum. Claire Wardle, who is uh, the person who originally brought this project, the ID Lab, to the Shorenstein Center, came up with a spectrum of how we look at this broader phenomenon of information disorder. And they're organized on here uh, in a spectrum with respect to how harmful they are, right? So it's more harmful on the right than on the left, potentially. And a lot of pieces of, of information disorder can contain multiple components of these different things. Satire or parody, false connection, misleading content, false context, uh, imposter content, manipulated content, and then fabricated content. And fabricated content is the one people think about the most when people like me come to talk about things like this. So it's really important to think about what what do we call all of this stuff, right? The broad theme of research is information disorder, but this content and the places that publish it, what is it, right? Uh, Jim used this term before, right? It's very important to us, it is not this term. This is, this is the wrong term to describe what we're working on. Um, it's not always news, right? Um, Disinformation isn't always fake either. A lot of times it can be true information with a false context. And furthermore, this term has been co-opted. A lot of other people use this term to mean something different than what we're talking about. I like to use the term junk news. I think it's more all-encompassing, and it uh, relates to the idea of junk food or perhaps junk mail. It's, there's, it comes in a lot of different flavors and has a lot of different uh, reasons for being. Um, but it's definitely all junk. That's the thing that we notice about all the stuff that we look at. Um, so what, it, what makes junk political news? Um, if this is everything that's junk, um, it's going to be a lot of the same things that we saw before, right? It's all the fabricated stuff. It's a whole lot of clickbait. Um, it's a whole lot of hyper-partisan content. Certainly anything that's plagiarized. Um, it's most of the stuff that's misleading, and occasionally it's even satire, right? So that's the, the, the world in which we're operating. How do we know that it's junk news? Um, we look at a lot of these different signals. No one signal is indicative, but in combination they frequently are, right? So if it has a clickbait headline, that, that can be concerning. 
Mainstream news sources use them as well. That's why it has to appear in uh, concert with something else. If there's a missing or a fake byline, that's a big telltale sign. If there's actually false content, for sure that's going to be junk. If it's misleading or there's inaccurate context or there's plagiarism, if we can identify any of those things, we're sure it's problematic. Um, and then uh, these are some other things that we really need to see in combination. So if there's low quality ads, frequently low quality ads suggest the quality of the content that you're looking at. If there's highly partisan rhetoric or an inflammatory tone or even hate speech, those are all really concerning. And then there's some other things that we can look at more analytically, like how old is the domain name? Was the domain name like the New York Herald I just showed you only one week old or has it been around for 10 years? And then do we see the same content published across multiple sites? That can either be domain names or Twitter accounts or Facebook pages or YouTube channels, but if we see the same content uh, appearing as though it's published only once but published across a lot of different sites, that's a telltale sign. So about a, uh, two months ago, we held a convening at uh, the Shorenstein Center where we brought 70 newsrooms uh, to talk about all the issues that I'm talking about today. Um, and as a sort of experiment, I took all the newsrooms that were represented um, and I pulled all the data about their Facebook pages. So this is, be careful here, there's a logarithmic scale, um, but right at the far left is the BBC, who has almost 50 million followers, and it goes on down, I think, somewhere in here, my old organization, PBS NewsHour, is right here. You got bunched up all your major networks and major newspapers there. So this is the spectrum of a, a, a healthy portion of the news ecosystem that came to Harvard two months ago. We track a bunch of junk news sites. This is a similar set of about 70 junk news sites that we track and their respective Facebook audiences. This is not all of them, it's important to note. This is just the top 70 that I pulled out of our database. Why this matters is when you look at them together, right? The, the reach of these junk news sources is massive in comparison to these mainstream news sources. And in fact, like I said, if, if you continued adding junk news sources, all of these mainstream ones will be pushed into the next building. Right, there, there are so many, yeah. I'm just curious whether Breitbart ends up getting classified as junk. On this list, I actually don't believe that we have Breitbart. Um, it's a much more complicated question. Um, Breitbart falls somewhere in the middle for us um, based on the other criteria that I described, right? So there's some criteria that it matches, some that it doesn't. We definitely examine Breitbart, but I don't think that I included them in that version of the list because it had one specific characteristic that we pulled for. Um, so this is the context, the background for what, the work that we're doing. Um, and so now I want to walk you through the approach that we use. Um, we start by trying to monitor the internet for content like this, junk news, misinforming, information disorder. And we have two approaches to monitoring the content. The first is source monitoring, looking at sources that we're concerned about and, and watching whatever they say to detect additional sources of, or additional instances of misinformation, disinformation. The other is topic monitoring, so focused on specific issues that we think are important and understanding the ways in which misinformation can be spread about those issues. Then once we've identified something through our monitoring approaches, we assess that content. And I'll walk through this a little bit later, but we essentially enter it into a database. We do a sort of basic scoring of that content. And the stuff that scores the highest based on our criteria, we then analyze. Um, once we analyze it and we understand it better, if we, if we think it's important enough to, we report about it. And we have a variety of different ways in which we report out the things that we find that I'll explain a little bit later on. So um, I'm going to start with source monitoring. The, the, the challenge with source monitoring is that these sources don't necessarily want to be found. And sometimes when they're found, either by journalists or by the platforms in which they exist, they get, uh, they're identified, they're outed, or they're even suspended or banned, right? So this is a game of whack-a-mole, trying to find new sources. Um, the question is, how do you find those new sources? What, what can you do? Um, the answer is this woman, um, identified. Betty Manlove on Facebook. Um, she's 86 years old, she's Christian conservative, she's a Trump supporter, and she lives in Indianapolis. She's not a Russian sock puppet, she's not an avatar for a bot, she's my grandmother. Um, what I discovered monitoring tons and tons of misinformation on Facebook was that my grandmother had liked many, many pieces of it. And I'm sure we all have somebody like this in our lives. If you look on Facebook for the worst quality content, they will frequently have liked some of it. Um, she's, she's liked this page, which is a fake version of US News and World Report. But more importantly, she's liked over 1,400 other pages. So when I started to dive into the other sites that 
my grandmother had liked, what I found was a whole lot of sites no one had identified before. And it's not just my grandmother, right? I, I should just say, everyone always wants to meet her, so we featured her in the PBS news story we did, so I always like to play a little clip of her so you can get a little sense of who she is. I go on Facebook because members of my family post pictures and I can keep track of my family that way. Betty Manlove used to be a smoker, not anymore but she still battles an addiction. My other addiction of, uh, is Facebook. I have a, I, I've lost hours on Facebook that I should have been doing other things. And while pictures of her grandchildren and great-grandchildren lured her to the social networking platform in the first place, it is politics that fuels that addiction. I was raised Democrat. However, I have decided that I will not vote Democrat again. Yeah. So that's just a little taste of her. If you're interested, you can watch the whole series on the PBS NewsHour. It's called Junk News. Uh, but it's, it's not just my grandmother, obviously, right? Here's another one of my own Facebook friends who's a uh, Hillary-supporting liberal that lives in Brooklyn, New York, who also loves to consume what I refer to as junk news and has liked hundreds and hundreds of pages. Um, the, the, the broader idea here is looking at these sources that we know are junk, trying to find new sources of junk. And we can do so by looking at the audience for it, right? So if we take um, Junk News Site A and we look at all the fans of Junk News Site A and all the fans of Junk News Site B and the fans of Junk News Site C and we look at what other pages they like, that overlap is really likely to be more junk. And so we've built a system that allows us to monitor for this and identify new sources um, to investigate automatically. So uh, every day we're polling um, Facebook to try and identify what these new sources are, and we're finding that new ones are appearing every day. Um, I built this tool uh, starting at the PBS NewsHour for the investigation that, that we just aired, um, but now we're using it at the ID Lab as one of many tools to monitor misinformation spreading across social networks. So it does a couple of things. Um, it allows us to identify uh, new domains that are appearing. So that, that site I showed you earlier, New York Herald, it appeared at the top of this newest websites list because it was registered just a few days ago and had been shared from one of the domains that we track. We also extract the entities from all the content that we're mon monitoring and attempt to create a useful summary of what are the most popular trending terms. And we also have a variety of ways to look at the actual content that's coming out of it. Um, so, the, as I just described, we, these are the, the main features of the tool that we built. Um, it autom automatically identifies new suspect sources. It allows us to um, search all the text that comes both from the articles and from YouTube video transcripts. And we're also adding um, OCR from meme images to be able to track all of that content. Um, it create, gives us a useful graph, a map of the graph network of the pages and the domains uh, and the groups that are engaging with this content. Because what you'll frequently find is a dozen different Facebook pages that all share from the same domain. And that's a strong indicator, but it's also useful to say, all right, what other pages are related to this? And when we look at those networks, it helps us to identify, here's a cluster around which we should be doing some investigation. In addition, based on that criteria I described before for what constitutes junk news, we've developed a sort of basic junk scoring algorithm that tells us if it has junky ads, if it uses clickbait content, if it uses all caps uh, in the headlines, um, if there's no byline, we can score content based on that to identify the most likely to be junk so that that rises to the top in our analysis. And then as I showed before, it also does new domain identification. So this is one of the main reasons why I'm here. Because what's next is a whole bunch more stuff that we don't have all of the skills in-house to do. We're, we're contracting out with some other software developers, but we really want some of the best people um, at this institution to help us think about these things. We want to come up with the best uh, trending topic um, algorithm to identify what are the important themes that we're seeing within our cohort of sources that we need to be monitoring on a daily basis. Frequently those parallel mainstream news coverage, but not always. Um, a lot of the things that we see in the world of junk news uh, persist for a lot longer. Um, an example I'll get to later is uh, Colin Kaepernick and the uh, Nike memes that were spread a couple of weeks ago. Those are 
ever present in this world in a way that they aren't in mainstream news anymore, and that's a really important concept to understand and explore. Um, in addition, we're working on integrating this with other platforms. So right now it works with Facebook and with YouTube. And we've done a lot of work with Twitter, but we haven't actually integrated it. And then we also want to integrate direct monitoring of both 4chan and Reddit, as well as some other um, more fringe platforms. Um, we've got some basic work done on image similarity detection, but we want to enhance that a lot. It's a challenging problem to do at scale, but um, it's with enough horsepower you can do it, but for the mo at the moment that's really expensive and we're looking for ways to optimize that. Um, and we also want to build much more effective topic monitoring, which I'm going to get into next. Um, this is what we see every day coming out of the sources that we track. It's one of the more significant components of it and one of the areas that we're planning to do a lot deeper investigation into, is to understand how something so shareable, so engaging, um, can carry so much potential mis- or disinformation. Um, I'll sh we saw some examples up at the top, and I'll talk about a few more later, but I just want to give you a picture of it. This is yesterday, the first page of results. Um, so the next step of this process after, uh, or sorry, the, just to summarize what source monitoring is. Um, at the moment, we monitor junk news sources on Facebook. We also have suspect sources on these other platforms. Um, we're doing thread-level monitoring on 4chan and Reddit. So on, on 4chan, that's primarily the slash Paul uh, thread on 4chan and slash Donald and a few others on Reddit. And then we're also developing investigations into Discord, WhatsApp, and other closed networks. And we're also focused on a lot of emerging platforms. There's a, there's a much longer list than these that I put here. But in a lot of cases, people are leaving the mainstream platforms for fringe alternative or free speech, and I put free speech in quotes, frequently that means hate speech uh, platforms where they're not likely to get banned. Um, so the next part of this is topic monitoring. And over the last couple of months as we've been uh, building out the lab, we've been monitoring across all of these sources and across using a variety of techniques to try and identify mis and disinformation. Um, and we recently did a sort of reflection process where we tried to identify what are the key issues that we want to focus on between now and the end of the year. Because we could focus on everything, but we have a really small team and that's not going to be possible. So we, we worked through a, a whole process to identify these nine categories that we felt were the most important that we're going to look at now and, and flesh out in greater detail. So the first one is the midterm races, because one of our reasons for being is to focus on the impact of mis- and disinformation on our political discourse. Um, election integrity, and by that we mean voter ID, um, of the vote integrity, and a variety of other related issues. Um, Islamophobia, one of the things we've seen in this uh, round of midterms, is, or, uh, this round of primaries, I should say, is a lot of Muslim candidates and a lot of um, incredibly hateful language being uh, thrown at those candidates. Um, we have a variety of issues. This is sort of the signature issue of the last two years is around immigration um, and Latinx issues. Um, and then racial inequality, spreading from Black Lives Matter uh, to Blue Lives Matter and everything in between. Um, and then the economy and inequality, uh, which is a, a broader theme around we which we don't see a lot of the same kinds of misinformation, about, but around which we are incredibly concerned that misinformation can be spread, especially as the issue of the trade war grows. Um, then foreign interference, I don't really even need to explain. Platform accountability, this one is, uh, it has a few different meanings. In this context, what we're really talking about is how uh, platforms are potentially censoring their users and how uh, users respond to the behavior of the platforms. And then finally, sort of catch-all thing that we've always been focused on, which is conspiracy theories. This goes Pizzagate, QAnon, and a whole host of things I don't even want to say all the terms of. Um, so how do we do topic monitoring? Um, at the moment, this is a pretty basic process, right? We're, we're developing compound Boolean search queries to identify content that we're specifically interested in. So it starts with those big, broad topics. We look for the, the topic or theme words that we're looking for, and then we end that set of terms with specific disinformation concepts, right? So Hillary Clinton alone is not something that we're searching for, but Hillary Clinton and a term Arkansas, which I only learned a couple of weeks ago, which is a conspiracy theory about all of the people that have died in relation to Hill and Hill, Bill and Hillary Clinton, is a disinformation concept that we're interested in. And then we would also not out a bunch of terms that we identify are ones that we are not interested in or that generate results we're not interested in. Um, so we're, we're 
we're developing this process and iterating on it over and over again to, and evaluating the various results we get on the different platforms to try and optimize our search queries to use across all of the different platforms that we're looking at and specifically to filter on the, the sources that we've identified as suspect sources. Um, here's what we're looking for. We're looking for basically all the things that you saw up at the top, right? We're looking for misinformation of any kind. Um, we're looking for fabricated content, for sure. We're looking at recycled content. Frequently something we see is a, a piece of true information or misinformation that's really old gets recirculated at a point, like right now, because it's somehow topical again. And every time we identify that, we try to trace back how and why it's happening. We're looking at these more complex or nuanced things, the idea of false context and misleading narratives. We're also really interested in coordinated amplification. A lot of people talk about this as bots. That bots is sort of one form in which coordinated amplification can take place. Sometimes coordinated amplification can be manual. It can be a group of people on 4chan who said, let's do this. You take this job, I'll take that job. And they attempt to push out some piece of information. That's what we saw with the Emma Gonzalez meme up at the top. Somebody said, here's a meme, figure out how to Photoshop it. They Photoshopped it and then they started, they agreed to spread it around. And the last thing we're really interested in, this is personal for me too, is targeted disinformation designed to trick journalists. Frequently what we see are people who purport to be someone they're not to get interviewed by journalists or uh, take information, photoshopping a headline and, and recirculating it on social platforms, doing things specifically targeted to get coverage, to game the coverage system. Uh, so I want to go back to this approach. We talked now about source monitoring and topic monitoring. I'm gonna go into these last three, but I guess before I'd been talking continuously for a while, does anyone have any questions so far? So, uh, this is sort of like a technical question. So, uh, when, when, you're, when you're monitoring the, these websites, so for example, Facebook or Reddit, right? So, uh, what sort of web crawling mechanisms are you using? Are, are, you, are you just uh, sort of creating fa fake IDs and then sort of uh, scrolling so, so there are a lot of complicated questions loaded into <laughs> there. Um, so the primary mechanism by which we get data out of Facebook is using the Facebook page content API. Because of the limits uh, that have been imposed on that platform um, since uh, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, we're, we've run into a lot of challenges. We used to be able to get a whole lot of API queries per hour, and now we get a whole lot less. So what we used to do in about 10 minutes is now a query that we have to run over the course of a whole day, right? So we have to spread that query out so we don't run into the API quota on Facebook. That doesn't get us everything. Um, in order to accomplish some other facets of our research, we use what I refer to as direct collection. So one way you can think of direct collection is what I described before. When I go to my grandmother's uh, page and I look at all the content that's on it and I record it. Other people use other terms for direct collection. I choose not to use those terms because I don't think that there's a distinction between automating the process and doing it manually. Um, and in fact, if you're interested, um, I am party to a, I don't know how to put it at this point, Recently, the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University has published an open letter specifically directed at Facebook, arguing that uh, academics and journalists need to have a safe harbor in their terms of service in order to do what people re frequently refer to as scraping of content, things that violate the terms of service of these platforms. I feel really strongly that uh, in the interest of journalism and in the interest of academic research, we need to be able to be protected from litigation um, as we attempt to do these things. That is an open uh, question at the moment, both legally and ethically, and we're all working on the exact approach to solve it. But um, we do not, at the moment, use uh, false uh, user accounts, but that's not outside of the scope of what we might do. Does that answer your question? Um, anybody else? I can keep going. Uh, so we talked about the monitoring approach, and I'm just going to quickly cover um, the rest of this, which is uh, assessment analysis and reporting. So when we identify content through our monitoring um, approach, one of our different monitoring approaches, uh, we evaluate that content against a rubric for how relevant it is and how important it is. Um, do a couple of steps to verify the source, the spread, and the content itself, and then we score the item. We answer, this is, just, this is a sampling of the kind of questions that we um, have our research analysts answering about each piece of content. And if the, if the um, aggregate score for this particular item 
of a threshold, then we refer it for analysis. So the idea is we've got a funnel of content, right? We start looking at everything, we pick stuff that we think might be uh, mis or disinformation, and we stick it into a database and we answer a few questions about it, and then some of it um, we goes above. Sorry. Just a quick question. Do you have people answering all these questions? Yes. Um, some aspects of this can be automated. So, um, for example, this one, we can pull some data in from a variety of APIs, depending on the kind of link that it is. Um, but we have a team of research analysts who are monitoring uh, across those sources and across those topics that, we've, uh, that I described earlier, specifically looking for this, trained to understand what the distinction is between just some hyperpartisan rhetoric and something that might have the potential to uh, miss or disinform someone. Um, so if, if something is above that threshold, uh, we analyze it. So this is really more what you can think of as a traditional journalistic investigation. Here's a piece of content. What else can we uh, learn about it? We research the subject. Uh, we investigate the main issue that it's trying to address. We do detailed verification. If there's an image, we do things like reverse image search to identify whether or not that's a real image or a fake one, um, or, or it's got an incorrect context. Um, and then we also try to identify what are the related, um, what's related content to this, or what are the other themes that this is related to, what's the big picture here. Um, and then we also analyze the risks, because one of the key things that we're concerned with is how does knowledge of the existence of this piece of misinformation going to impact the public, right? So if uh, newsrooms decide to write about it, could they possibly be providing further oxygen to whatever this misinforming theme is? Um, yeah, So the, the goal is to get that part of the process down to one minute. Um, so it's, it's the, 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 we're looking for the things that you can very affirmatively answer. Um, so if, if you're on, the way that we talk about it is if you're not sure, then, then you, you ignore that answer. We want, the, the point is the things that are very clear and easy that are gonna rise to the top because there's a ton of different types of content and some of it, all we really need to know is here's a piece of content that looks like it's got inflammatory rhetoric and it's on this topic and only after we see a dozen of them do we think that that's something that we're likely to report on. In other cases, we identify one piece of information and it seems much more critical that we investigate further and so then someone's likely to spend a little bit more time on it. We don't have an answer to that question. That's uh, at the very end. That is one of my, not specifically indexed by Google, but understanding the scale of this problem is one of the bigger research goals that we have. Um, so I'll just, th we're, I'm just about finished here actually. So um, the, the last thing that we do is analyze risks, which I covered briefly. Um, and then there are different mechanisms by which we're reporting out. So we have a uh, collaborative newsroom <laughs> Uh, community in Slack. All the newsrooms that I mentioned up at the top, they're all members of a, of a Slack workspace that we use where they can share information with us and we can share information back to them. So if we identify something, and we're like, oh, we, we notice this thing is trending, um, we think it has this problem, we'll drop it into Slack and share it with the rest of the community so that they're aware of it. Um, in, in certain cases where we identify uh, patterns or trends that we think deserve greater um, investigation, we will um, flag those and do a bit more research. And we're um, starting next week going to be sharing out uh, a newsletter that's a, a weekly briefing on the specific themes that we think are critical for anybody who wants to subscribe to know about. Um, in some cases, we're going to identify things that we are part of a deeper dive investigation. And those we'll do is collaborative research with other faculty at the Shorenstein Center or, or other parts of this school or others. Um, and finally, in some cases, what we're doing is uh, training webinars and, and ongoing conversations, a dialogue with newsrooms and with other interested parties about these issues. So that some, in some cases, the things that we do will just end up being training materials for understanding this phenomenon more broadly. Um, so this is just to uh, go through a few other things. We have a couple of other projects that are all related to this that, that we think are really important. Um, the first is understanding the evolution of memes. So um, a researcher from Digital HKS is going to be joining us soon who's an expert in memes and analyzing them using machine learning. And she is going to look at exactly how one meme evolves over time and integrates other facets of mis and disinformation as it evolves. Um, another area that we're quite interested in is platform accountability. And this is in a different context than the one I described before 
before, but sort of related. One is, how do these platforms make their decisions about discriminating against users? And I mean that in terms of suspending or banning accounts or downranking or in some cases referred to as shadow banning accounts. Um, how do they make those decisions? What's the level of transparency around those algorithms? Um, and then we also want to evaluate how effective these platforms are. So when they attempt some new strategy to mitigate the impact of information disorder, how effective is that, right? So, yeah. In order to do that, I, uh, there's one way you can do it that's controversial. I suspect you're, you're going to not do it, which is, this is basically to post your own stuff that's fake and see how quickly you get, you get uh, taken out. I, I, so it's funny because I've, I've hypothesized about doing that in the past, but there are some, uh, as a journalist, that I find really challenging. I think that what, what we're working on is sort of cataloging the scale of this problem and then looking at changes to that scale over time. Um, one of the things that I'll say is um, in, the, in the PBS NewsHour series that we did, um, that you just, you got to meet my grandmother for a minute, but one of the other main characters in the series um, is a purveyor of junk news. Um, so we spent a whole, uh, we did one whole episode about a guy named Cyrus Masumi who published uh, I used to have these in my presentation, and I've since removed them because they're no longer online. But he had two websites, one called Truth Monitor and the other called Truth Examiner. And they were virtually identical websites, except the word truth was written in blue in one and red in the other. And one was all liberal junk news, and the other was all conservative junk news. Um, and what, I, what happened actually on Saturday night was this guy, who I haven't spoken to in months, texted me to say, Facebook just deleted all everything I have. Like they, over the weekend, after quite a long time, and he had uh, collectively across a number of different pages, 30 million Facebook fans. He had three or four of those lines in the beginning. Well, surprisingly, it's many, many months later that they actually took action against him. And, and the thing is, he was working very hard to make money and skirt, you know, and, and, and trying to stay just inside the lines. But I think that what we're seeing is these platforms are getting more aggressive in certain ways, and so we're trying to monitor over time how these things are changing. We've also seen across a lot of the sites that we've monitored, the engagement that those sites has gone down over time, right? So they used to get a lot more, a, a site with a million Facebook fans could get, you know, 50 or 100,000 likes on a post, and now they're getting five or 10,000 likes on a post. So there's definitely some impact there, but they're, you know, the whack-a-mole game is still at play here, right? Those people are still finding new pages to go to and new ways to publish their content. Um, so, yeah. So, um, sorry for like, asking so many questions regarding your method, but like, you, you, may, you had this, this graph on engagement, and mm -hmm. from what I understood, you counted the number of likes or the number of followers these pages had. Mm -hmm. but, like, so, so my question is, uh, and this is, this is well documented in research papers, a lot of um, pages, what they do is they hire click farms and, and, and sort of a lot of uh, legions of fake accounts liking their page just to be, make it more popular, right? So mm -hmm. are you accounting for that? Because I feel like that is something authentic so, so this is the last bullet point here is about coordinated amplification, right? So one aspect of that can be click farms or bot networks, right? Um, it's challenging to account for that. Um, I've done a lot of research, I would say, traditional journalistic research, so not analytical research, trying to understand that phenomenon. One of the things that we've found, and I've been speaking with a lot of other journalists, when we think we've found a big inauthentic network, a bunch of bots or click farms, when you dive in a little deeper, you discover actually most of those people aren't fake, they're real. My grandmother absolutely looks like a bot. Like if you were to look at the stuff that, you know, but, but and, and, I, and to be perfectly honest, I wasn't sure until I went there and I sat down at her computer with her, whether or not in fact, perhaps her computer was infected, right? That was one of the hypotheses I had, was that perhaps there's malware on my grandmother's computer and that's why she's liked all these pages, because this doesn't even make any sense. But what I discovered was exactly what she said. She spends a whole lot of time on Facebook engaging with this content. The other thing that I think is really important that I learned from the, the guy I mentioned before, Cyrus Masumi, is I, I asked him point blank, like, did, did you try and inflate the volume of your likes? For some reason, he said, no, there would be no point to that. Because what he's trying to do is build a big audience on Facebook, drive them to a page, and feed them that content and the ads alongside of it, right? He basically plays an arbitrage game. And so what he does is he runs ads. He runs ads on Facebook that say things like, do you think Donald Trump is the greatest president ever? If so, click like to agree. 
and he's gotten very, very good at crafting ads that uh, get the most click-throughs. And just like with any other content on a platform, the more engaging your content is, the cheaper it is to run. Right? So if you've got two ads, one that's really engaging and one that's not so engaging, the one that's really engaging by a factor of 10, let's say, means every click you get costs one-tenth the price of the crappier ad. So he got really good at that and he built ads and, and consults to a lot of people. Here's how you can build ads, which essentially means buying likes on Facebook. Right? It's not buying likes like the click farm. You're buying real likes and real people because you actually want real people to look at your ads and, dr and drive traffic. So it's really hard to... Uh, quantify exactly the scale of this problem, but this is one of the other things that we want to investigate. It has a whole lot of challenges, right? I'm reminded of anyone who's seen, I don't, I think it was not the most recent, but the previous one uh, of Homeland. There's, a, there's an amazing scene in there in which they do something that seems like it should be science fact, but it's probably science fiction, in which they analyze and put the layers of activity of, diff of social media accounts. And they draw these beautiful graphs that show all of these accounts did this at this moment, and then all of these accounts did this at this moment. And we can see all of this, um, which I'm sure is something that Twitter can really effectively do, but is much more challenging for us. And more importantly, on Facebook, which I think is a much bigger part of the problem, it's really hard to do. But we're trying to develop a similar methodology to that to try and understand not just frequency or tempo of behavior, which is one way in which you can analyze an authentic activity, but coordination of behavior, right? So do we see the same things happening across multiple accounts at the same pace over and over again? And if we see that, then we can start to come up with estimates for, well, this percentage of the engagement on that thing looks to be this way versus another way. But what, one of the things that we keep seeing is a lot of real stuff. Things that we didn't think were real turn out to be real people. Um, and I'll actually give you a quick summary of that here in the last two slides. Um, so briefly, I, I mentioned this, which I just wanted to put some pictures up here. This is the original one, the, um, the original Nike meme. This meme got, um, I don't even want to say co-opted, but, but memeified into, let's talk about D-Day in World War II, let's talk about Pat Tillman, let's talk about uh, September 11th um, in two different contexts. Um, and then it, got, then it evolved even a bit further. Right? It, it became an attack on a bunch of um, liberal politicians. And then also thought, why not associate some of you know, history's worst people with it? And then it became, let's, tag, let's turn this meme into another meme, a very popular existing meme. Now we're going to criticize Nike for it. This is just a tiny snapshot of all of the memes related to this particular subject that we're trying to get deeper into understanding and mapping the uh, relationship between. Um, another thing that we're looking at, which ties together the idea that we were just discussing about coordinated amplification with the potential for it um, and platform bias. Uh, we've just finished in our on the verge, I swear to God, somebody's going to let me publish this any day now, uh, a bunch of research that we've done into this idea of shadow banning. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with it, the concept of shadow banning is that on a given platform, um, the algorithm of that platform, or perhaps even people at that platform, have decided to suppress your speech, but without actually suspending your account, such that your voice no longer appears in other people's feeds, but it's, that's not clear to you. Um, what happened a number of months ago uh, was people developed concerns about that. There was some reporting on various news outlets about it. The president tweeted about his concerns about it. This website, shadowban.eu, appeared, and it allowed you to drop in your Twitter handle and it would tell you whether or not you were shadow banned. Um, this is some example of how people responded to this. They would run that test themselves and then they put these red X's into their accounts. Um, this gave rise to um, what appeared to be a conspiracy theory that only conservative accounts were impacted by this um, and no liberal accounts were. Um, we conducted uh, some research into this. We did a really large random sample of Twitter accounts that were active over a period of days, and we executed the same test, which was actually a legitimate test for whether or not users' tweets appear when a quality filter is either on or off. Um, and the results were really shocking. And I'll leave it at that until two days from now when we get to publish it. <laughs> um, so the, this, is, this is really... <laughs> uh, all, all I will say is um, it's not a conspiracy. Um, there, there's more to it than that. Um, the 
Broadly speaking, the work that we're doing at the Information Disorder Lab, we hope to answer these kinds of questions. We want to understand the scale of this problem, right? How many pages, domains, users, or even dollars are involved in it? Um, we're continuing to find more and more content, but at some point, we hope to scale up technolo using technology to eventually get um, fewer and fewer new results so that we know we've covered some percentage of the total universe of this content. We want to understand better what the most common forms are that information disorder takes. We know what the different types are, and uh, we think that, in fact, the totally fabricated stuff is a really small percentage, but we want to put some numbers behind that. Uh, we want to understand how this content impacts the audience. Is it actually changing the way people think? There's a lot of academic research into this already, um, but a lot of it is very limited in scope in terms of what percentage of sources people are um, referring to when they do this analysis, and we want to broaden that out a lot. Um, and then we also want to do this last thing, which is understand how these changes by the platforms are affecting the spread of disinformation. Um, so that's it. Um, I'm happy to answer as many questions as you have. Maybe. I'll... Thank you. So before you start taking yep. other questions, sure. I will ask the shield question, which is if anybody here wants to get involved with this, do they contact you? Do they contact somebody else? How would they? Uh, how would they help? So in the room here, um, right in the back, is Hong Q, um, who is. Uh, I know that we have the, all these issues with what titles you can actually use, but he's essentially the CTO of the Shorenstein Center, although we can't say that. But so he's one person you can talk to. CTOs uh, are so good, everyone wants one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and uh, Jim Smith, who's right over here, um, who helps run the lab, or myself. Any of the three of us are people you can reach out to. Um, we, we would love to get um, your thoughts on what holes there are in our approaches. We'd love to get your thoughts on how to optimize these pieces of it that we don't have the technical expertise to solve on our own. Um, in particular, this uh, topic monitoring strategy that we've got, I spent a long time trying to figure out what are the best mechanisms by which to om um, optimize compound Boolean queries, and I haven't found something very useful yet, that I, and I think that there's probably a lot of people here who understand that better than we do. So. Um, not, not in this context. So um, I think we, we were at a conference at MIT a couple of, like two weeks ago. Some other, I was there and a couple of other people were there, but it was not specifically to recruit. It was more talking about the issues. And yeah, we, this is the, we've been working on this on our own. This is the first time to look for outside help that we're not contracting. So um, it's it's really complicated, right? So self-hosted websites that are designed to be monetized seems to make a lot of sense, right? You you go to that website and you see it's filled with ads and it's that particular kind of ads from these ten different ad publishers and you see that they're frequency with which they're posting those on social media is such that you can make a kind of a clear, um, you can make the assumption that this, peop this person is trying to make money. Sometimes we find similar sites sharing similar content with no ads. And so that raises a whole set of other questions. Why are they publishing this content and not monetizing it? They, what is their motivation? Is their motivation um, political and domestic? Or is their motivation political and foreign? Yeah. I couldn't hear what. Does no ads, does that also include something like SEO links or something like that? Stuff like, are they, instead of running obvious ads, could they be doing SEO links? That is one possible, yeah, there, there, there's a lot of different, but what, there, there are different categorizations of what people are. Some people, they're, their motivation appears to be much more complicated, right? So it's, yeah, it's, it's a version of SEO that's connected to multiple different websites and there's sort of a ring of what's going on. But usually at the end of it, you expect to find some monetization strategy, right? Yeah. You can do that monetization. But on some other platform. That you, but so if you can't find it at the end, you, you, if you can't find a place where there is monetization, um, i.e. if there are ads or some other form of revenue generator. Like, in some cases, people are driving uh, traffic back to YouTube, because YouTube has monetization built into it, right? Um, and, but, but in a lot of cases, we don't find that. Um, on Twitter and Facebook in particular, and to, uh, 
a similar extent on these other platforms, what you see is a whole lot of content that's designed just to drive engagement, right? So those memes don't have themselves any monetization, at least on Facebook, but they're the most engaging thing. That's the most popular kind of post that an individual publisher can run, right? So by what, what I've learned from reporting out, talking to publishers like this is that they publish that content because that increases overall engagement with their site so that how, whenever infrequently they post a link to something, it still drives traffic. But the misinformation contained in the meme is actually much more potent. So we care about it a lot more than the thing that's actually connected to the monetization. concept of like a watermark or adding a link at the end of a meme. Mm -hmm. So sort of piggybacking on the memes engagement to get your site popularized. Mm -hmm. Are you detecting those ones? That those aren't easy to detect. Uh, well, so if there's a link embedded in it, we can obviously extract the link if the, in, in text. If the link is embedded in the image, it's a bit harder. But of course, what I've found, because I've been looking at this uh, specifically, depending on the size of the image, OCR can extract those pretty well sometimes and sometimes it can't, right? And so it's figuring out when it's uh, ineffectively identified something and going back and trying to analyze it. I've struggled to understand how useful that is. To, you know, how frequently, if there's not an actual link to click on, does someone see it text in an image and decide to write that into a browser to try and tra follow it? Mm -hmm. I mean, so they're, they're useful in terms of authenticity because there are user studies on how engaging ads are and as internet users get used to the internet, they start of, sort of start filtering out ads, mm -hmm. advertisements which are sponsored, but when you see these links and memes, they actually can get more authentic engagement with the people who are more interested. So mm -hmm. I, it's, it's an important area of research, I think. I'd, I'd like to talk more about it. We, so when I started building this uh, work before I came, I, just to be clear, I've been at the Shorenstein Center since July 1st, so this is new <laughs> for me to be here. Um, the, when I started doing this work, we spent a lot of time talking about ways we might be able to crowdsource aspects of it. Um, at the moment, we are not attempting to do that, and I think we might come up with a strategy for aspects of it in you know, the first or second quarter of next year, but it's challenging for a couple of reasons. One of the things is a lot of this content is really challenging, right? A lot of this content that as, as you get a little bit deeper into it, I mean, a lot of it is filled with hate. A lot of it is filled, I mean, you know, today, right now, all, all of the content is about Kavanaugh, right? So, uh, and what you see is a bunch of, you know, believe her content and a bunch of, this is all bullshit and, you know, and, and, and really what starts to be really misogynistic content on the other side. And so when you uh, spend a lot of time in these spaces, you need to be careful about what you're doing and how you address the sort of rest of a, of a person's needs. And I feel like the more you spread out that responsibility, the more challenging it might be. So it's, that's been a big concern for us, I think. Yeah. That is a great question and one that we are working very hard to answer. <laughs> uh, I think um, in general, we believe that the work that we're doing is exempt because everything is public um, and we're pulling it uh, from the web. Right, but, not creating fake accounts. Yes, um, but we, are, we, are, we have developed a um, detailed um, ethical framework in which to analyze each of the decisions we made as specifically around content collection, to evaluate um, to what extent it might be, might require at least um, a review by the IRB. But you're essentially a read-only project, that is, you're not writing anything into the internet, you're just... It, aside from our, the, the kind of reporting out that we're doing, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I should add, though, one of the things that I really wish that I could do before I came here was uh, recognition of how potent 
these ads were in building audiences and seeing the, the feed of junk that my liberal and conservative Facebook friends had made me think I wanted to create a website which was American Patriots for True Journalism, right? Put all these awesome terms into it and then share news articles from ProPublica and PBS NewsHour and everything else um, and, and just try to use those same tactics um, to, to counteract what's happening on these platforms. Uh, and I tried to convince the Knight Foundation to give me a million dollars to do that, and I'm still waiting for the callback. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think so. that, that back, back before I was at the Shorenstein Center, that was it would have been easier than now. This was not research, so there was no IRB mm -hmm. that he was talking about there. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I was just curious about something you mentioned earlier in the presentation about um, your investigation potentially extending into WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious as to how So there's a, there's a number of different um, pieces of that. And actually, I, I should say that the, we, we have a couple of different projects that have grown out of this lab, or out, out, of, out of our team at the Shorenstein Center, the, of which the lab is one part. Another project, which I can't really speak to myself because I'm not really involved in it, is a project in Brazil um, specifically focused on the uh, impending elections. Um, and that project has focused very directly on work uh, with WhatsApp. And that involved creating a network of newsrooms who collaboratively verified and debunked um, misinformation that they found online and, and published each of those debunks publicly um, and created a WhatsApp tip line for anyone to share content into this group so that they could then identify information. In addition, those newsrooms have reporters who are um, embedding with inside of various WhatsApp groups because a lot of misinformation spreads through WhatsApp groups um, to try and passively monitor and identify content. The, the framework, the ethical framework Work for dealing with closed network monitoring is um, a process that we're working on right now to specifically answer exactly how we deal with those questions because I think that's we're we're definitely going to run into some IRB issues even though it's going to be passive monitoring that we have to come up with the right answers to, to to feel confident that we're doing the research appropriately in terms of the actual techniques there's a whole bunch of different techniques that we can try right so we can try creating our own groups and inviting certain people to share them which is similar to what they're doing in Brazil with Comprova um, in addition we can try and enlist uh, regular users essentially crowdsourcing or um, getting journalists to uh, engage with specific groups and identify chains of groups um, there are a lot of invitation links that you can find to platforms like whatsapp or discord online that, that have a unique URL signature that we can um, identify and collect and then join those groups automatically and collect all the content that they are publishing. But there's definitely a bunch of issues that we're in the process still of working out. This is a, we're trying to understand what effective means are for addressing the big problem. So it's not necessarily about, we're not making a Harvard version of Snopes, right? Um, Snopes is doing great work and they are one of the newsrooms that we interact with. Um, and one of our questions in our rubric is, has it been fact checked by Snopes or by PolitiFact or whatever? Um, so it, our, our goal is to interact with newsrooms, platforms, and the public to come up with better ideas about how to address these problems by first understanding it more effectively. Because at the moment, I don't think anyone can say with any confidence how big this problem is. Right? There was a big study that came out um, either late last year or the beginning of this year that, that made this argument that false news spread at a much greater rate than true news, right? I don't know how many of you have heard that story. I think it was a variety of researchers. One of them was at MIT. Um, that, the math in that study was accurate, but the underlying 
premise was really challenging, right? Because the, the selection bias on what stories they were using was based on whether or not the content came from a website like Snopes, right? So by default, when you're analyzing true versus false, the true versus false determination was made by Snopes, but the editorial decision on whether or not to write something about it was also Snopes, right? So everything was likely to be more sensational or potentially questionable, and the percentage of things that were misleading was also really high. So I guess my, my point is, even that study, which was really good and really important, was missing the big context of how, how big this universe of misinformation is. And so we're starting at the point of we need to answer that, among other questions, before we can come up with reasonable suggestions for how you mitigate it. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. So you're, you're nodding in disagreement, or? Uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to use that term, but yeah. Such a term. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. All right, well, first, let's thank Cameron. Thank you guys so much. Uh, so let me also add that I hope that you had one of two reactions to this talk. Uh, reaction one is, Jesus, this is cool stuff. Uh, it would be really fun to, to, to work on this, in which case, you should uh, the other is, what are these bloody political scientists doing writing code? Or, or, or for that matter, I hope you also have that one. What a ridiculous thing he's trying to do. I could do that so much better, in which case, get in touch with me. <laughs> <laughs> because this is really important stuff. This is what circus is supposed to be doing. This is computation and society by definition. And so I want to thank Cameron for coming up and being insulted in various other ways. But I also want to urge all the rest of you to think about how you could contribute to this because it's an important thing and it's going to get really interesting really soon. So thank you. Thank you so much and thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it.